All right, guys. Are we good to go? Let's get this. this uh, yeah, every, everyone. Let's get this. Every, thing get, started. get 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 all everyone, your Everyone, like, out. get your blaze out. Get yeah. talking <laughs> properly. <laughs> do we need to do some warm ups? <laughs> vocal warm ups. <laughs> vocal warm ups. Okay, we'll do some she cool. sells sea shells by coffee. the seashore. I remember those uh, vocal warm ups from a uh, Clement. <laughs> What up, nerds? Welcome to episode nine of Powerful, a power metal podcast, where you take a break from listening to power metal by listening to people talk about power metal. This is Four Gates, and I am here with my very cool friends, Zelda Fan Three Five Five. Emphasis on the very cool part. Uh, I am in, I am applying that very cool part to all of you, so it's not just you. Sorry, you're not special. <laughs> and Darko. Hello, everyone. And uh, Larry Biscuit is not here today, so we have replaced him heartlessly with our other very cool friend. Oh, shit. I forgot how to pronounce your name. Here, let me try. Ed Ledron. Ed Ledron. You uh, completely botched that. <laughs> Ed Ledron. This is Ed Ledron. Ed Ledron. <laughs> If any of you watch Brooklyn Nine Nine, there's a joke where he can't pronounce his friend's son's Nicolaj correctly. <laughs> Nicolaj. It's like no, it's not Nicolaj. It's Nicolaj. It's exactly the same thing. Nicolaj. Ed Ledron. How how? Can we just call you Ed? Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Within a few episodes, I'm sure we'll get it. Yay! All right. So, uh, yeah, we we are gonna talk. So today, we are gonna talk about concept albums. Because we, because we know that power metal folks love concept albums, right? Every band has to have one. Right? Okay. We'll, we'll dig into concept albums and lyrics in general. Yeah, just, how what, important What is music lyrics? about? Yeah. Let's not forget rock operas. It's art. Oh man, I love all that stuff. Don't you? I, I'm not sarcastic at all. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> I don't know where I'm going with this, but before we get into that, let's start off with some news. Our first news item is that our rumor that Conception was reuniting is actually confirmed. Fake Holy news shit. was real news? What? Yeah. Trump was right all along. Apparently. Amazingly, Larry was right. And Conception is getting back together. And they're going to release a new EP... And the way they're attempting to do that is with a pledge music thingy where you have to pre-order it. So if enough people pre-order it, they will be able to actually do it and release it. Yeah, and just in case anyone missed the last episode, uh, Conception is like a prog rock band from Norway. The lead singer is... Roy Khan, formerly of Camelot, and it's a. I think it's a pretty big deal that they've decided to reunite because they were like disbanded since the nineties. Roy so, Khan is back and not doing Christian music. Yeah, it's a big deal to have Roy Khan back in metal. In music in general, <laughs> yeah. So we will have that link in the show notes if you would like to pre-order this very mysterious kind of album. Like we don't know if they're doing crowdfunding because they don't have a record label anymore or something like i don't know what's going on with that yeah they don't have a label it's just a cool thing to do these days they don't have a label and instead of trying to find one they are just trying to self-release yeah i respect that that's cool Plus, though. it's it's not too big a thing it's just an ep yeah they just want to get their feet wet with like the idea of like creating music again it's a shame that Larry's not here to experience his fake news being right. <laughs> Maybe that he's but, just too busy celebrating. But the thing is, if he was here, then it would still be fake news. So maybe it's kind of okay that he's not here. <laughs> he's here in spirit, so... <laughs> he's here in spirit. Yeah. All right, cool. So that's Conception. And another band that has new material uh, is Avantasia. Zelda oh, fan, boy. do you want to talk about that? I would love to. I love me some Avantasia. So Avantasia has a new album announced called Moon Glow coming out January of 2019. That will be, I guess, three years after the last album, Ghost Lights. <laughs> Such now, a long time away. I know. It's all, it's a long time. Yeah, he, he announced this really, really darn early. 
Maybe we'll get some teasers at some point. But in addition to this... Wait a second. Uh, I wasn't listening. When did he say this new album would be out? <laughs> Oh, God. January 2019. Oh, shit. And we're recording this in May, so that's many months away. I am sure that other listeners will have missed that, so thank you, poor kids. We'll be sure to remind you in several months when the album comes out. (laughs) Yeah, no, my I have like a five minute memory span. Like, there's no way. That wasn't even five minutes. (laughs) And on top of just announcing the new album, he also announced a new world tour. They'll, they'll be taking Avantasia all over the world for their biggest show ever. Granted, uh, they have only announced a few countries in that, mostly in Europe. I'm hoping, a, I really hope that they'll come back to the, the United States. Don't think there's a good chance of that, but we will hope. Well, that's hardly the world. I really don't think they will, like, honestly. Just don't have your shows in the middle of the week like they did last time, and they might have more people show up. Yeah, well, you know, Maybe even if they, they had a Monday night show in Anaheim, and they filled the House of Blues, which I believe is no longer in Anaheim, or like it's no longer at Disneyland. Yeah, the Disney one's not there anymore. Yeah, and I just thought that was so odd, because the stage was so small, I have no idea how like like 17 people fit on that stage. I just made that number up, but Evan Pisa <laughs> is... Is consists of a lot of people. It's supposed to be an incredible live show. I'd like to It read... is an incredible live show. <laughs> <laughs> like Tobias, Tobias, Samet Toby, Tobias. I would like to read his lovely quote here announcing the album. I've been trying to calm things down for the last 18 months, but apparently my best way of relaxing is to be creative. Yay. During this phase, tons of ideas have been coming to my mind that literally demanded to be realized in Avantage's epic style. I was so convinced of the songs that I realized very quickly, if ever there is to be a new chapter of Avantasia, then it has to be with this new material. Past all the trends and rules of the music industry, handmade and personal, with epic 10-minute pieces alongside catchy rock songs. Everything was created for only one reason, to write great music without any businessmen shaping it into bite-sized pieces for the modern entertainment landscape. Oh Moon Glow will be the most lavish <laughs> album of my career. The Holy biggest, shit. most colorful, and the best and most unreasonable luxury I have ever created in my life. I can't wait to release the album in January and then take the Moon Glow World Tour on a journey around the globe, except for America, where you will witness the biggest show Avantasia has ever put on stage. That is so Toby. Uh, it's except so Toby. Like, it's so dramatic. It's great. North America, he's probably skipping. Uh, Australia is probably skipping. Uh, do they do they hit up like China or Japan? It'll all? be like it'll be like one show probably in Japan, not. two shows Latin America. I think they've done Japan. Okay, <laughs> world tour. Can't wait for them to come to South America. Yeah, and they actually come to South America, so yeah. that's why I I didn't include that continent in my list of salty continents. They go to Rio <laughs> slash countries uh, sometimes. I think. <laughs> Yeah, wow, he sounds really excited, and this Moonglow thing sounds like a rock opera kind of thing. So, oh, I think all their albums are kind of like that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, I guess I guess even even more so, maybe complete with, like, uh, overly complicated narrative and, like, eight main characters or something. Oh, boy, I wonder if that's foreshadowing. Oh, oh man. my. Four <laughs> gates shadowing? Hey! Hey! hey. <laughs> I'm sorry. You're but this so is gonna be one this. of my this is gonna be one of my um, probably most anticipated albums coming up. I really liked Ghost Lights. But will so. it be power metal? Um prob- Prob- I don't probably I don't know. N- probably not. I don't know. That's what everyone wants to know every time Avantation announces an album. He starts with more successful symphonic rock. So They haven't been power metal since uh metal opera because I mean, they usually have a song or metal. two which is power metal. Yeah. Um but Especially with the Kiske on vocals. That's all you need to be power metal. <laughs> Just have Kiske so singing they, really what high. Have, what did they have that was power metal on the other one? Like Unchained the Light? I thought that was like one of the more boring tracks on the album. How I think, dare you? I think, I think, honestly, it was just... I think Toby is more interested in writing like dramatic, like theatrical songs than power metal nowadays. Yeah. He's more into rock. That's just my opinion. Yeah, like dramatic poppy rock songs is kind of his thing, but it, yeah. it it has some of that overlap with power metal that I say it's close enough. 
<laughs> okay, yeah. close enough it is. I'm still looking forward to it. I'm not shitting on Evan. Welcome Station. to Close Enough, the Close Enough pa- Metal Podcast. <laughs> <Close> en- <laughs> Semi-powerful, the Close Enough Metal Podcast. Ten to week. Power yeah. Metal Podcast. <laughs> okay, so the next uh, new release that we want to talk about is... Right. Well, for um, this, we're going all the way to Morpheus. Japan. Yes. Yes. So we have a new album, kind of, from Unlocking Morpheus. It's actually a re-recording of an old album of theirs called Sarako Jealousy. The old album was just called Jealousy. And the good news is that this album is actually already out. Yay. The bad news is that you have to import it or find it through other means if you're in America or Europe. No. The other good news is that it's actually a very good album. Yay. If you're into a JPM. And the other thing is that their guitar, or sorry, not their guitarist, but their drummer... I actually recently joined another band called Gonarius, which you may be more familiar with. Oh, yes. What? And Gonarius. Yes. And Gonarius is putting out a uh, new Blu-ray soon of a live concert. Oh, that's exciting. Yes, and that will be out on May 31st of this year, of course. It's very soon. So if you're a Japanese power metal fan, you've got some good stuff coming your way. According to our analytics, Japan is like our third biggest set of listeners. Yep. So if that's not lying oh, to us, we've got plenty of Japanese so awesome. fans. Hi, Japanese listeners. <laughs> you get these albums easy. Yeah. Listen to these albums and then write to us and tell us that they're awesome. And then it will be sad that we can't get them. Mail the albums Yay. to us. And then mail them to us. And then we'll listen <laughs> to them. And then we'll all be happy. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> We're just telling these bands to... Put all their stuff out on the open market. Yeah. That's going to be become the powerful, you know, power metal distributors. You know, <laughs> yeah. black market. <laughs> you know, all these bands are just independent, so it's kind of up to them. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe they can get on Bandcamp so we can purchase their albums through there. So everyone in Japan, tell your favorite bands to put their stuff on Bandcamp, please. For every, for the enjoyment of the rest of the yeah, world. Yeah, and then we'll buy all their stuff. Or bands are actually putting their stuff up on uh, Spotify, Unlucky Morpheus included for a few yeah. of their albums. That's true. That's true. Oh, so they're on Spotify. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. You can hear the excellent Vampire and their new single. I'll be sure to check mm-hmm. it out. And do you know what else is on Spotify? The Blind, Blind Guardian? Blind Guardian? <laughs> <laughs> Blind Maybe. Guardian. They seem to be fitting in and out. We have... A new but old record by Dragon Force. We have oh, Blast Doors. We have the Blast Doors. We have Repower <laughs> Within, which we talked a bit about coming out in the latest episode. And now it's come out. And we, at least the ones that listen to it, we can say that even though the original didn't need any work, it sounded okay. It sounded great. This one sounds like 10 times better. It's really, really? Yeah. it's a really good really difference at how good it yeah. sounds. Yeah. Like, it's unfortunately, amazing. it's actually not on the uh, American Spotify. It's not. What? Yeah, no, it's not. It's I not know, American it's Spotify. Larry gave me like a sketchy Russian stream to listen to it from. <laughs> oh my really? God. <laughs> I thought it yes. was worldwide available. I just got no, it. No, they hit America. No, Darko, oh, you man. win again. Well, I, I, I everything else from Dragon Force is up on there, so I can't believe it. You win on. all the tours, you get all the good Spotify releases. That's so weird, man. You're just pretty much winning. Uh, Spotify and album rights issues beside, like it is such an impressive like remaster. Like we talked about how Valley of the Damned remaster like really brought that album to another level. The same thing applies here. It's like the guitars, the vocals, the bass, keyboards, like everything just sounds so much better. You can actually hear things on the album. Like, I could not believe it. It really does step it up. Now you can actually listen to the backing vocals done by Emily Ovenden. Like, nobody knew there was actually a female vocalist in this album unless they read the credits or saw the free behind-the-scenes videos. I asked a lot of people and nobody noticed because you can you couldn't really hear it in the original release. Mm-hmm. And now they are there in a couple of songs. And the main thing is that since this is a remix, they went in and changed some songs. There are some elements that were left out in the original release that are now back in, and like uh, some bells in the intro for um, this song that I don't remember the name, but you know the one I'm talking about. 
And Sing it. You, <laughs> do it, Darko. Was it uh, Wings of Liberty? Wings or? of Liberty. Yes, Wings of Liberty. Nailed it. In the, in the intro of Wings of Liberty, now there are some bells. And in in Seasons and in Cry Thunder, you have extra harmonies that weren't there before. Especially in Seasons, you have a whole section of voices that are doing a counterpoint that wasn't there in the original release. And everything sounds just super wide, more low end, and very controlled and pristine and so nice. Some artistic decisions might not be of like the best for everyone, depends on your taste. Mm -hmm. uh, but technically speaking, this is great. And I hope that all the any following Dragon Force albums are mixed like this because it's great. Yeah, it really does give me hope for Dragon Force's future. Like, I wasn't too big into reaching into infinity, but like seeing how good of a production that they made this. Like, I'm I'm on board. They they've got me back in. Well, they have to fix their uh, songwriting first. Songwriting's part you of know, it. I think I think we figured out why reaching into infinity was so weird and not very Dragon Forcey. Reaching into infinity was written mostly by Fred, like the their bass player. Leclerc. Yeah, Fred. He's written yeah, some yeah, songs yeah. on before. I totally right? butchered that. But yeah, the, yeah, that guy. Know who it is. In, it's usually it's usually written by uh. Like most of their previous material is written by like Sam Totman. They need to get more songs written by their keyboardist because like the two that he's done are <laughs> yeah. good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, that's why Reaching Into Infinity is so different from the rest of Dragon Forest, and I'm gonna say different because I don't want to be mean. <laughs> oh, let's be mean. It's bad. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's pretty bad. It's like a hot fucking mess. Like the long track is supposed to be epic, but it was just like all over the place. Yeah. And it's like, if you want to make an EDM album, just make an EDM album. Like, it's fine. Anyway, <laughs> let's not talk about Dragon Force anymore. Uh, you guys make uh, Repowered Within sound like it's really worth listening to. So maybe I'll actually go check it out. I'd recommend it. Like, the original is just obsolete now. <laughs> the, oh. the originals yeah. never existed. R.I.P. Okay. <laughs> R.I.P. Original Powered Within. You've been replaced by Blast Doors. You need the power full within powerful with it maybe they'll remix it again make it like powerful and put our voices on it <laughs> <laughs> what a disaster <laughs> okay speaking of disasters um let's talk about let's talk about heavenly oh so so who who here knows a power metal band from france called heavenly i do they're awesome do. when they they're exist great. um they they exist do they well that's they? a good question kind of maybe they existed. Does that count? They haven't put out an album since like 2012 or something. No, it's 2010. 2010. Oh, Jesus, even, even worse. Yeah. Virus was 20, 2007, and then the one with like two naked women. I don't remember. Carpe what it's called. diem. And it sounds a lot like a queen worship. It's 2010, I believe. <laughs> well, case in point, anyway. Heavenly is a power metal band from France that is very excellent. They have some of my favorite albums, but they haven't put out anything in a very long time, except for like the occasional like little thing on facebook which they just recently on may 11th did posted a couple pictures it's saying, two selfies <laughs> yeah, two selfies saying useless. reunion day chantiers hashtag heavenly hashtag ben soto hashtag oliver le Pouy, i don't know i'm Olivier. bad at french Olivier. and hashtag peewee and, and the last hashtag is hashtag back to metal okay so <laughs> boom confirmed heavenly reunion new album yeah back no. to metal there you go Next tell all your friends that's what I said last time about Conception reuniting, but I don't know. I really don't believe this There was one. something more substantial there, I think. Yeah, like a phone recording of somebody in a warehouse in Norway. Yeah. <laughs> but this is like a selfie and like... There's nothing on it's this. It's a selfie a and a hashtag, but it's on an official it page. It is wishful thinking. This, is, this doesn't mean anything. Heavenly yeah. is dead. Just drop it. <laughs> yeah, this is, the fake, this is the fake news corner. This is going to be yeah. ZS fake news corner. Uh, yeah, I hope I'm, that I, I hope keep that Larry's the proud of us for doing this. <laughs> We're all just tricking into thinking Larry's still here. Yeah. Heavenly, they're gonna seize the day. You know. Oh, <laughs> oh. I get that reference. <laughs> oh, hilarious! I know. So, should we talk about other bands that may or may not be dead? More fake news are definitely oh, dead. If you insist, Dr Dragonland. <laughs> Dragon, oh man! What's Dragon going on with Dragonland? Well, Dragonland's a really excellent symphonic power metal band. They were. They uh, they've been dead for a while because their last album, Under the Great Banner, came out several years ago. It was excellent. And then uh, 
But recently, again, we got a post on Facebook, official Facebook page. It's a yes. selfie. That's a freaking <laughs> selfie. <laughs> you guys. In the studio. Maybe. Kind it's saying of. Dragonland strategy meeting. Yeah. And they're no, drinking it says beer. Dragonland strategy meeting, and there's the guys at a bar. They're drinking. Yeah, they're not even they're in just, the studio. They're just then. hanging out. Okay. They're not even in the studio. Okay, everyone, calm down. Sit. It's a strategy. I just <laughs> went in again into their Facebook page. And there's news. There's a post from two hours ago. Oh, fresh news. Whoa. They are, Dragonland really? is extremely excited to announce that they will oh. be touring Australia in September oh. following their shows in Japan. Oh, shout out to Australians. All right, shout out album. to Japan. Right. Yeah, that's it. That's, it's more touring. So I guess they, hey, that, they that, are doing dead. stuff. Wow, they're, not they're dead. active. I mean, didn't that's they amazing. do a little tour a while ago too? So... They played. They were the United, some, They were in yeah, Prague Power. Yeah, they or played Prague Power. Yeah, they did. Nothing's going to come of this again because Amaranth is what prints money. I mean, gotta believe. I man. can't really blame their guitarist <laughs> for sticking with Amaranth instead of Dragonland. <laughs> I can uh, blame the him Dragonland for having shit so taste. Oh <laughs> man, oh. We, we bring you on. You're just firing shots yeah, at that's everyone. Harsh. <laughs> yeah, that's how I roll. You gotta at least call them nice people first. We are unaffiliated with this guy. I am oh. sure that that Olaf is a lovely human who means all the best. Yes, and I'm sure he's a very nice he person. Just paying yes. his bills. You gotta make money by riding EDM bullshit with Amaran <laughs> instead of nice power metal <laughs> with Dragonland. I love you guys. Oh boy. <sighs> Love you too. Getting heated already. Like, I, I wasn't talking to you. <laughs> I was talking to. We need some blast doors to hold back. We didn't even get to our show reviews yet. Where we have to, we have yeah. to save it for the show reviews. But first, um, if you want to find links to all of our real news and fake news items, and if you want to look at all the selfies of the heavenly and dragonland members, we will have links for all of those in our show notes which can be found on our website. We actually have a new domain now. Uh, it's just powerful-podcast.com. And you can thank Clary Biscuit. It just goes to the standard website, but it's easier to type and share now. Yeah. So powerful-podcast, powerful-podcast, the little line thingy. We're, so, we tried to get the not hyphen one, but it's taken. Oh, yeah. Who so it's we're going to try our best. We'll get it some We're going to take it back when it expires from the other owner. But... Anyway, you can also find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of our monthly content. And also, we post a lot of stuff on Facebook and Instagram pretty frequently. And you can find us there on Powerful Podcast. And also, uh, be sure to leave us, if you like what you hear, be sure to leave us a review on iTunes. It really helps us uh, grow the show if there are iTunes reviews. So then when people Google or search powerful or not powerful, just like power metal podcast, then it makes us appear just, on the Internet. So. Just tell us what you think. Get involved. <laughs> yeah, this is one way you can help us grow the show. And maybe if we have like a bigger audience, we can do more cool shit. So yeah, that's that's our that's my plug for for our little podcast here. Are we done selling out? Or? Um, Remember to like, yeah. comment, and subscribe. Ah, uh, see, <laughs> like, comment, and subscribe. Smash that like button. Wait, am I supposed to say that? <laughs> you can. You can say it. <laughs> I'm not gonna stop you. It's just, okay. I'm gonna put that evil off on you. Mm, yeah, this is my this is my job as like the somehow. Yes. Well, no, I'm I'm just a I'm just Instagram operator. So if you, if you any of you listeners want to talk to me, um, prepare for some awkward conversations. Just message me on Instagram. I'll reply, and then message us on Facebook if you want to reach someone who's not me. <laughs> you can make a friend. <laughs> Leave comments on YouTube or Reddit or Facebook anywhere. Really. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I really like it when people send us comments. Like, yeah, we read we read everything. Send send us band recommendations, like. I don't know. I've had some good conversations with people through messages. So, yeah, interact with us. Powerful podcast on Facebook and Instagram. Anyway, enough of that. Let's talk about shows. So we're not just like a bunch of losers that sit at home and not go outside. We go to well, shows. 
I mean, going to shows doesn't right? mean you're not a loser. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> it's a low bar. God damn it. <laughs> well, we tried. We tried. Yeah, so the first show that we're going to talk about is Nightwish in April 2018. Yes, Nightwish was doing their big decades world tour. They came they came around. I went and saw them. I had never seen Nightwish before, so I was excited to see them. Like I really like Floyd Johnson or Janssen wanted to see her live. Janssen. And they're playing, you know, it's the decades, you know, big 20 years thing. So they did a variety of songs from basically all the eras, which I thought was really cool. Went on down. I saw their show in San Jose. And overall, I liked it. But I got to say, it's like kind of a really lame crowd at the Nightwish shows. Why were they lame? They didn't do anything. <laughs> Like, okay, there was my favorite thing about like metal shows is like there, there's an energy there, even if you're not moshing or punching people in the face or whatever, it's still like excitement, like people headbang or throw the horns or oh man, I totally want to punch or, people in the face to <laughs> exactly. that's, that's by that's hardcore dancing, not metal dancing, <laughs> whatever. But case in point, it seems like the crowd just was not into it at all during the Nightwish show. Aww. Which is weird because like they pulled like a really big crowd and it's like this big exciting metal show. But they've got like a fucking screen in the background with like pictures changing, yeah. and they're all you know very talented musicians, but they don't they don't interact with the crowd that much. And Nightwish I wish... doesn't interact with the crowd that much. I guess they really don't. They just like thank you. Because I think they're <laughs> I feel like they think they're too good for it or something. I don't know. Or they're too no, no, it's artistic just what they're or something. Music. Yeah, that's you know, another thing. Is... Nightwish, a bunch of stuck up. <laughs> what? Yo, 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 yo. That's, that's, that's that a little, too far. That's Your a words. little bit much. That was too far. <laughs> I'm sorry. I will, I will bleep it. <laughs> they are. No, no, no. no. They're, I'm sure they're lovely people. But they get a lot of trauma. They're, they're wonderful humans. Oh We're going to burn all of our bridges before they're even built. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Nightwish's music isn't really like as sing along or anthemic as your standard power metal fare. It's not power metal. That's probably why. Some of the songs are. And even like the more energetic songs, like they played like the Kinslayer, which is really cool. Yo, and, like have the red lights throwback. and there's like fire on the screen. Oh. They did Devil what? in the Deep Dark Ocean. You know, like some of their heavier yeah. songs. The ba- like the crowd wasn't into it. The crowd was more into Nemo and Elon. Yeah, the crowd's there for most of the radio friendly, like Look, popular songs. The mm. Nightwish audience is the symphonic metal audience. And the symphonic metal audience is kind of cordoned off for some reason from the rest of the metal crowd. Like, they tend to not like a lot of other metal. Not everyone, of yeah. course. So if you're some symphonic really? metal fan out there who's really into other metal, good for you. But Shout out to <laughs> symphonic metal fans. We still love you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Carry on. But they get this audience that's not really into metal. I mean, they're into other more popular forms of music, into very... Or they're more into, like, symphonic orchestral stuff, like like movie soundtracks Yeah, and stuff. pop rock. Not necessarily like, metal. Like, Dylan's yeah. basically symphonic pop rock more than they are symphonic metal. We'll get to mm-hmm. them later, yeah. Yeah, we'll get to them later. I've got a lot to say. <laughs> <laughs> of course you do. So, I liked a lot... I like, I like the... Uh, variety of tracks that they had. They had some really good ones on there. There was no opener, so it kind of made the beginning of the show kind of awkward, especially when they had their whole "Please don't record" with the, your cell phone thing. Uh, Wait, what? what? They had like they, they had that's... like a whole like video presentation asking you to not record with your cell phone. That and is uh, kind of weird. That's a little weird. I mean, I think that people can make their own decisions. Um, People still did it. Yeah, I mean, it might have been, it might have reduced it some, but no. yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I'm going to take their side on that. Okay. I think that going to a show and just attempting to do a shitty recording with your phone instead of enjoying the show is just doing a disservice to you as the audience and to the people that are around you that are annoyed because you have your phone up there blocking the view. But look, you chose to go to the show. You bought the ticket. I mean, you're showing up for the band. That should be honor enough for them. Yeah. yeah. The way I see it is, like, when I am at a show, I ch- I'll usually get, like, a little bit just, like, for the sake of, like, my own, like, it's like a souvenir. So yeah. I don't have to pay $50 for a t-shirt. <laughs> and I, I try not, and, like, I'll do it when it's maybe a point where I know the other people aren't going to be, like, knocking the phone out of my hand and I'm not blocking other people's view. Because I usually stand towards the front anyway. Yeah, I'm 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 totally not a phone recording person either, but 
at this at the next show that we'll talk about, I actually did try to record and it turned out terribly. <laughs> anyway, do. do we have any do we have any other things to say about Nightwish? Uh, I'll just add a couple other things. They like okay. they have they had the screen in the back, which I think gave like a nice bit of atmosphere to some of the songs. I think it would have been cool for them to put like the lyrics to the choruses up there. When they did that for uh, the greatest show on earth, like towards the end, when they do like the big like "We were here" we chorus, were here. that's like the one time the crowd got involved, and it was actually made it a lot more fun. How about hey. that? Oh my god! Speaking of the greatest show on earth, they played way too much of that song. They did, did like, they play so all too the much animal song. fucking noises. They, okay, let me get into this. So they did like, like f- the five minute <laughs> piano intro, where it's the same like ten second riff over and over again. Yeah, and then they eventually got going, but they put the narration in there. They had like. And they had the animal noises, and then on the screen oh it was like the God, POV so of like terrible. some animal hunting down some other thing. It was they had weird. POV of animals having yes. sex. They were oh. having sex. It was like hunting. Oh, I see. So That's it was still weird. It was strange. Although okay. I think my favorite part of the show was prob was probably seeing a ghost love score as their closer. Oh, that's a good yeah, closer. My introduction to Nightwish was actually seeing the like end of an era video of Ghost Love Score. That is a very so, good introduction. Coming full circle like that was was, was fun for me. Yeah. It's a great live song. Awesome. Yeah, I think Ghost Love Score is a very well done like long song. Mm-hmm. It shows you that long songs don't have to be boring <laughs> and full of animals. Yeah, that that fucking. that's a long song done right. <laughs> so I, overall, I would recommend the show. Uh, just, it's not really a metal show. I, I would say Baby's first metal show. Yeah. If you gotta Baby's introduce a normie friend show. to a metal show, that's like the least offensive one you can get into. I actually yeah. took, so my fiance is not a metal person at all, and I took him to Nightwish, and he didn't like it because I told him metal show, and he expected metal show, and you need to tell him that's animal not what he got. Show. So he was just like, this, that was kind of weird. <laughs> yeah. Richard Dawkins narration show. <laughs> <laughs> weird biology documentary show okay anyway let's talk about camelot may 2018 yes camelot yeah let's talk about that hey it was a good show (laughs) sorry ed but came nowhere near me oh you didn't go that's just a little salty because uh they didn't tour in his town for some reason they haven't toured in my region for years and i'm in the united states oh my gosh well that's not a surprise because the united states is really big but they're big cities here. And I I don't know, like, I don't know how they decide whether to skip a certain region or not. They just know exactly where all of the people that from our, like, group of people are and say, oh, no, we can't oh. go to all of them. They're trying to avoid me, really. <laughs> What's that? He's they're our biggest fan. No, you. no, no. <laughs> they're just like, man, we want to keep Tommy safe from this guy. He's, yeah. like, way too obsessed about it. Pretty much. <laughs> just for his own safety, let's uh, stay away. <laughs> far away so the show itself uh was pretty good so they had battle beast and delane opening battle beast i've seen once before and i wasn't huge on but i think i liked them more this time because i knew what to expect and i was able to just kind of go along with it you know it was my first time seeing battle beast and um and i actually thought it was super fun it was really funny because um the guy playing the synths had this shirt that says it's britney bitch <laughs> and then <laughs> And then um, the leads, the lead singer, uh, Nora, she was like, are you guys ready for something heavy? And then crowd was like, yeah. And then like the, the, the it's Britney bitch guy started playing some mad synths and we're like, fuck yeah, synths. It was Bastard Son of Odin, I think. I secretly, not so secretly love that song because I think it's <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> I think it's hilarious that their idea of a fast and heavy song is Bastard Son of Odin. Bastard Son of Odin. Yeah, it's it legit was stuck in my head for like two fucking weeks after the show. <laughs> what sound of a good song? It's it I, I, I don't know. So yeah, Battle Beast is fun. They make for a good opener. Nora's got a lot of energy. She's very yeah, entertaining. No, to watch. it was great. I, I I like Battle Beast. I still think my old complaint of needing more variety in there songs that I mean, they but, do but it's, stands, it's but battle beast yeah like, okay <laughs> fair enough like i said you get to know what you're going into and you'll be fine yeah uh, following them up was delane who comes all the freaking time around here i've never seen them until this wait this was your first time i think we went over this before, yeah my I first can't time believe this is your first time i've never seen delane before this you guys I don't know this how is I my fourth time seeing delane no they come on too many tours like once it was fine i guess yeah but they're on every power metal tour that comes through the united states 
it's too much. Yeah, I'm I'm not f- too fond of their music. I thought their performance was fine. You know, they were trying. Like you, you know, know. I, I honestly think Delane improved. Cause, yeah, they have improved over the years. Yeah, like uh, Charlotte, the lead vocalist, singing. Like, she's way more on key now, and <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's great. Good. And then yeah. they added a second guitarist. They added, I, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce her name. Meryl something, starts with B. But yeah, she's guitarist for uh, Mayan and her solo, her band project that I can't remember right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> You gotta get your facts but, straight yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm super good. But anyway, they added a second guitarist, and she's a rhythm guitarist, and she like makes Delane have a heavier sound. So it's actually like a little bit more guitar driven now. I gotta say, the best part of Delane was the production values. Oh my gosh! We were yeah, so, so hyped about this. Yeah, so I was like trying to record this show because I was like, I'm gonna like have Facebook stories on the powerful podcast account. Which you can still see. It's on, like, the archives or whatever. The Instagram, but, I think. Yeah. Uh, what did I say? Yeah, Instagram. But anyway, um, I was going to, like, stop recording, but then Delane whips out their custom mic stand that has their band logo on it, and it actually lights up, and it looks like a fucking lightsaber, and it's sparkly. It's pretty sick, to be honest. Yeah, and then the keyboard guy's, like, keyboard stand thingy is also rainbow. Like- Delane had bigger production values than Camelot. Yeah. yeah this is something yeah, like yeah, rainbows a, everywhere. A LGBT band. I approve. LGBT. <laughs> Shout outs to LGBT folks. Um, yeah, so many lights, dance party. It was crazy. I don't the people know. near us in the crowd were like really into it, and I think I was enjoying the show the show more like through them seeing how happy they were. About yeah, a lot it. of people show up for them. I'm yeah, I'm surprised. glad that I'm I'm glad that it made all these people happy because happy people are good. We we, we can spread positivity on this on this yeah. podcast sometimes. Delane has their audience. I'm glad they uh, have a band they enjoy. <laughs> I've shit on Delane enough, but I'm gonna like give them. I'm gonna give them props this time for having glowy, sparkly mic stands and for making all these people happy. <laughs> but then we got into the main event. We got into Camelot. Oh yeah, which is like opposite of happy, oh. but it's it was a good show. It was a very good show. I really liked yeah. it. Uh, probably up there, top five of the ones that, I haven't seen that many, so it's not a big deal. Tommy's a great oh. front man. Yeah, Tommy was killing it. You know, he's he's really hot. He's a good singer. Lots of energy. Yeah, he is really hot. And gets he, the he, that beard though. He, get, he he has really good crowd interaction. Like he makes yeah. eye contact with people. You got to make the crowd feel special. Um, I, get them yeah. involved. He makes you feel. He special. does a really good job of uh, addressing the audience that he's in front of, and not just doing some rehearsed thing. Which you know, yeah, there are a lot of bands who do a great rehearsed club show, but I think it's special when. A frontman really addresses the audience that they have. Yeah, in previous uh, Camelot, and even, well, I saw Seventh Wonder once, um, he made me feel like we made eye contact <laughs> and that we were soulmates. <laughs> <laughs> and I was thoroughly convinced. But That's, uh, that's <laughs> time know. right there. <laughs> it sounds that's official. Pretty, that's pretty good crowd interaction right there. I mean, you're basically married. Yeah, we're basically married. <laughs> yeah. The show was a nice change of pace after the night we showed to have a crowd that was involved singing along to the songs. They had a lot of, like, their big, like, popular crowd-pleasing songs. They did, you know, and then the light, or When the Lights Are Down, uh, Forever, Liar yeah, Liar. Those. I, I could have used a few, uh, fewer uh, Shadow Theory songs. And, yeah, and, they did. Weren't there only uh, a few Shadow Theory songs? No, like, they did, like, like two three, or three of them. Yeah, they did three of them, which is, like, a few too many. A lot. <laughs> yeah yeah well, we of. just spent the last episode <laughs> shitting on shadow theory yeah i don't know <laughs> do you think it was better live it it felt better live maybe just because it generally things are more like exciting the energy live. like generally things are better live but i think like i still stand by my opinions composition wise it's oh yeah for sure par yeah yeah i like replace one of those with center of the universe and i would have been a very happy man they used to play that what, they didn't play center of the universe that's they didn't they didn't play they center don't. Of the universe. that's they, one of their key not, songs it's my it's favorite not on song this set list they used to play Could it include it they usually do the best part of that of that show gotta say was when they started playing forever out of nowhere Herman Lee from Dragon Force oh, yeah. is on stage. <laughs> it's like, what the fuck? I had no idea. I think I was in shock. I was just like, wait, is that Herman? That's Herman Lee. Why is it Herman? That was that was really hype. Like he and uh, Tommy yeah. Youngblood were like playing guitar together. I think yeah, it was, was only awesome. that one show that he showed up for. I imagine yeah. so. And I like to think <laughs> that this is what happened. So 
just paint okay, this to paint stories. this picture. Made up story time. Herman Lee, he's on vacation. He's off at Disneyland. You know, he's <laughs> having a grand old time. Camelot, they're on their tour bus. You know, they're rolling into Anaheim. They go and just pull up Snapchat. They see Herman Lee's Snapchat story of him at <laughs> Disneyland meeting like the characters. He's going to Space Mountain and all the fun oh, stuff. That looks fun. And they're like, oh shit. Herman's in town. Let's hit him up. And they're like, yo, Herman, you want to play guitar on a song for us? And he's like, sure. I just got me, you know, some Dole Whip and I, I'm, I'm chilling. Let's, let's do this. If you are still in the song. So there you go. It was, it was probably like the most hype moment I've ever seen at a show. Just Herman Lee out of nowhere. I think I was like too confused to be hyped. I was just like, why is he there? <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> What's he doing there? What's going this- on? Is this really okay? Is this real life? <laughs> Is it just fantasy? Camelot, good show. <laughs> I'd recommend it. Yeah, shout outs to Camelot. Shout outs to surprise Herman Lee appearance. We were lucky enough to witness that in real life at the same show. Yeah, we we exist. We can both go to the same show. Yeah, unlike Heavenly and Dragonland. Oh, oh. <laughs> you gotta rub the salt in. So I guess... <laughs> Speaking of hype shows, yeah. I recently went to a show that uh, actually wasn't power metal, but I guess we're talking about it here. I went to Tesseract, and it was my second time seeing Tesseract, but my first time seeing it with their current and, I think, original vocalist, Dan Tompkins. And I mean, that show was just amazing. I'd recommend it, even if you don't like prog metal or gen or whatever, because you know, there are bands that go out and they just play their songs. And that's great. And then there are bands that go out and really put out a show. Like, these guys brought these really fancy spinning light things that could put out cool optical illusions. You know, the vocal- vocalist hopped down into the crowd and gathered everyone around him at one point. You know, everyone was on point. The music was really great for, you know, getting everyone moving. So, yeah, I think the tour is either winding down or has already ended. But you know, if you see them in the future, check them out. That sounds really cool. So let me ask you this. Um, I know a lot of us metal people are like, yeah, who cares about lights and whatever? Mm -hmm. We just want the music. Like, do you think that having good production is actually like effective in enhancing the show? Definitely. I mean, if you want to just listen to the music, you're not going to get a better experience for that than, you know, staying at home and listening to, you know, what they put on the studio. I mean, maybe if you're really into the authentic side of things and you really want to hear them play live and stuff, I mean, that goes for some people. But when you go to the show, you know, really it's an audio, visual, physical, smell experience. And you really want the best experience in all those areas. And if the band's just going out and doing audio, I mean, it can be a good show. But having a great visual display really puts it on the extra level. You know, getting crowd engagement out there, you know. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. You want all those experiences to really make it memorable. Uh, I wonder if any bands have, like, put up lyrics so that the audience can sing along. Yes. Doesn't that sound fun? I it's mean, like karaoke, yes. but, like, with that's a lot the best. of people. That's big thing in uh, Japan. Yeah. You've been to shows like that? It's not power metal, but I've been to uh, Muse shows, and they do that for the great songs. Do they? The, wow. the most popular songs. Uh, like, the songs that they play at every show and the big ending, they just put a sick video and the lyrics are coming so that people can join in in, in the singing. That's that's great. What does Muse end with nowadays? Because I haven't seen them since... Uh. Um, since Absolution came out. <laughs> That's a long time. I think they still close with, with Knights of Sidonia. Ah, oh, they close with that now. Wow. That's I amazing. think so. Yeah. Yeah, no, I was song. like an old school Muse fan. I just kind of like forgot about them for a while. Yeah, but I have too, actually. That's awesome. It's not, it's not Power Metal, but they are putting now, there's a worldwide event on uh, movie theaters they are showing a recording of their latest tour in a super special way, one day only around the world. That's nice if you want to check it out. Wow, that's pretty cool. We can cut this non-power metal chat for the episode, but it's nice to say. Yeah, no, that, that's fine. Yeah, this just goes to show that uh, we don't only listen to power metal. <laughs> and I think it's good to like have um, a broad perspective on music. So you a don't broad like... Case. Yeah, 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 absolutely. 
Like we said, the Close yeah. Enough podcast. <laughs> yeah, speaking of more close enough non-power metal stuff, um, you guys also saw... I can't pronounce this. Tour in Orphanland <laughs> and other coming bands. Yeah. A- yeah. <laughs> Aetonam and Ghost Ship Octavius were the other two please, openers. Please tell us about that show. It was pretty great. Uh, Ed, you, you, you saw him first. you want to take away the bit you saw? Well, I had a busy, busy night, so I should only caught the last few songs of Orphanland and Tour's show, but... Orphanland definitely put on a good show from what I could tell. You know, the card was actually starting to mosh from one of their sore songs, so I guess that says either something about them or about Portland. But a tour was on point, definitely. They had a good mix of songs from across their albums. Um, unfortunately, this tour is kind of playing their new album, and, you know, so got to take what you can get. Mm-hmm. Definitely uh, lived up to their albums and stuff so yeah i uh really dug seeing orphan land live they're a really cool band like a middle eastern folk metal you don't really get stuff like that and like these guys have been doing it for like 20 something years so they know what they're doing they put on a really oh, good yeah. show they are they are like i think they're one of the innovators of of like mixing in their middle eastern slash arabic influences in metal mm-hmm. so guys smith has learned some things from them yeah <laughs> So, yeah, like, they were probably, like, my favorite opener I've seen for a show. Like, people got really into them. That They're... is a hell of an opener. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's it, opener. They were the third band to play. <laughs> but, uh, you know, sh- props to Adrian Ad- and Ship for uh, getting them uh, into it. Yeah, Orphan Land, if you can ever get a chance to see them, definitely check them out because they were incredible. And then following up then was Tier, tier Tour, whatever. They were, you know, really high energy, too. <laughs> tier Tour, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Faroese. It's hard name to pronounce. The, the Faroe Island band that sings about Vikings. Uh, they were they were really great. You know, just a riftastic show. That would be yeah. be how I describe it. Uh, lots of energy. Uh, their bassist dude was just wild. He was interacting oh, yeah. with the crowd a lot. He loved the crowd. Yeah, that dude was really owning the it. The crowd loved him. The crowd was getting was super into it. You know, there was a ton of moshing. You know, yeah. I saw lots of dudes with their shirts <laughs> off just flying into each other. Uh, oh, sounds like hmm. a lovely, peaceful metal experience. Yeah, you know, un- unlike when Nightwish told the crowd to jump during uh, "I Want My Tears Back," the crowd actually did jump dur- when Orphanland and Tour told them to. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, <laughs> our crowd was uh, super obedient, and everyone was singing along with like uh, "The Sword in My Hand" mm-hmm. and "Hold the Heat and Hammer High." You know, all all good stuff. Hold the Heat Hammer High. Nice. Not not to dig on Nightwish his show anymore. They didn't even do an encore, even when the band was banging uh-huh. for, for like ten minutes. They didn't. No, nope, there's no. So they just encore. they just played Ghost Loft score and left. Yep. It was a two That's hour show, really? no opener, no encore. That's really awkward. It was very awkward. That's weird. <laughs> I hope they never listen to this podcast. We're just no, they're, like they're above listening to podcasts. We're just like calling them pretentious and awkward. We're not getting an interview with them. <laughs> and it, they, they have great music. Yeah, yeah great music. I, I, I still like enjoyed the show. Yeah. And, and but the, I'm sure they're lovely the people, too. Good. And they're lovely people. Yeah. Yes. Tour and Orphan Land. Orphan Land in particular, I think, are lovely people. Because, yeah. like, what they have to go through. They're all about peace. Being from yeah. Israel in a metal band. Yeah, yeah absolutely. If if uh, if you guys are more interested in Orphan Land, I actually watched their documentary yesterday. Uh, just go to YouTube and type in, type in Orphan Land documentary and... It's actually just super interesting um, listening to all the band members talk about like life in Israel and like their upbringing and like why they believe so strongly in like peace among religions. So if you have some free time, just watch it. It's 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 really. I don't know if I was just like kind of drunk, but it it was <laughs> <laughs> the documentary like hit me pretty hard. So <laughs> how would you compare it to the uh, ex Japan documentary on an emotional level? Oh my god, I. I don't know. I don't know if I can compare the two. X Japan was just like in another level of like of like tears. Hey. <laughs> Were you drunk watching that one too? Uh, no, I was not. It was a weekday. I had work tomorrow. Drunk on tears, maybe. <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't make me remember that. that yeah, movie. I know. Um, I think like my fiance and I were like texting Darko when we were watching yeah. it, and everyone was like super sad. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very sad documentary. <laughs> yeah, that band has been through some shit. The saddest yeah. of sad. Yeah, no, X Japan just has like a very sad like story to begin with. So yeah, 
music documentaries. Watch those. They're and good. shows. Go to them. They're fun. And shows. Go to them. Go outside. And don't be a nerd. Don't be a nerd. <laughs> but, but, uh, but we say sub nerds at the start yeah. of every show. <laughs> uh, you you can be a nerd. But uh, be an outside nerd. Yeah, be a nerd outside. And also listen to some concept albums. So uh, what even is a concept album? Well, we uh, stole the definition from Wikipedia, as is tradition. And a concept album is an album in which its tracks hold a larger purpose or meaning collectively than they do individually. This is typically achieved through a single central narrative or theme, which can be instrumental, compositional, or lyrical. Sometimes the term is referenced to albums considered to be of, quote, uniform excellence, unquote, rather than an LP with an explicit musical or lyrical motif. The exact criterion for a concept album varies among credits with no discernible consensus. And we can confirm yeah, this. Because we, yeah, because uh, even when trying to plan this episode, we couldn't agree on what we even yeah, we, would consider to talk about. Yeah, we had some disagreements about. among ourselves, which we'll get yeah. into later. So, um, a brief history. Basically, it's an album about something. It's an album about something. And it can be vague. Something. That's yeah, very that's, vague something. We're, we're, going to, we're going to go into this now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, the... So, um, brief history of concept albums in popular music. Where where have we first seen people make concept albums? I'd say the most notable one would be the Beatles, Sgt. Pepper's, Lonely Hearts Club Band. Did I say the whole name right? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's that's a correct name. And that's generally, within pop music, uh, that's considered like the first big one. Technically, it's, even inside pop music, it's not the first one you have... Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invasion shown having freak out before that it, and it's actually mentioned as an influence to Sgt. Pepper. But since Sgt. Pepper is the one that was super successful and everyone listened to it and because it's, of the Beatles. Yeah, because it's the Beatles. Mm -hmm. And it started it said that it started what it's called as the album era of popular music, which is bands focusing on instead of making songs and then releasing a collection of songs, actually thinking in terms of, okay, I'm going to plan this album and it's going to be something that it's worth listening from start to finish and not just the songs by themselves. Not just I mean, it's singles. Really the origin of the album, not just concept albums, but album says a whole well I'll, yeah that sounds really important that's yeah. a that's an entirely new perspective of uh like songwriting yeah like yeah. albums have been a thing for years before that obviously but yeah. just in this manner of okay i'm a band we have these couple songs that we might not have even written because it was the the standard at the time that you have writers and composers and then bands that perform and you have like i don't know five 10 songs, release an album, tour some towns, then another 10 songs, another album. Like at the time, albums were put out maybe six months apart from each other. Now, th this uh, Sgt. Pepper is credited with making popular the idea of taking a band and saying, okay, we're going to go into the studio and spend a year working on this long shaped <laughs> thing, like long length thing this like full one art, its own artistic whole work yeah. yeah because if you go writing an album versus songs yeah. and this is the main thing uh because if you go if we go with the definition that we read before uh technically Sergeant Pepper is not a concept album <laughs> because it's sort of <laughs> it's it kind of and it's very big because it starts the idea of the album is that they are playing a band that is not the Beatles they are this that, that album that you're listening to is Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, not the actual Beatles. So the first song introduces the band. The second song is presented as sung by this band. And then you have all the other songs that are just different songs, completely unrelated between each other, either sonically or lyrically or by any stretch of the imagination. And then at some point near the end of the album, the second to last song is a reprise of the first one. And then you have another song. And and they, everyone admits, like, beyond the first two songs, the concept is lost. But the, since the whole album, the, the album art goes 
with this idea of them being another band and they had lyrics printed in the back of the of the sleeve of the album so that you sat listening reading with the lyrics and everything everything tied together in a nice way from the art to uh, the idea of the first songs and the music and all a lot of bands were influenced by that and say okay we're going to start doing stuff in this way like we're going to write albums with um with a unifying theme in mind so let me let me ask this rhetorical question um so sergeant pepper's lonely hearts club had two songs that like tied to the whole theme of the concept album like does the entire album need to go along with the concepts to be considered a concept album? Or can you just have that concept like tied to only a few of the album's songs? I would say generally it needs to be the whole album. Ideally. Yeah. I go with yeah. I wouldn't call it a concept album if if it's not like it's, it's in the name. The whole it has album. to be the whole album. I suppose more interestingly how specific does the concept need to be right yeah, yeah. that's, like that's, that's thing. what we got into in our this is where, yeah for sure where, and yeah. also another thing is um i hear from a lot of um like fans of power metal and i guess other metal in general like does lyrics really matter in your enjoyment of the music i think there's a few angles to take with that and that one like the words being said don't uh, you know they don't objectively change like the notes that are being played or yeah. sang so in a way the they don't affect the, the music whether the singer is singing about unicorns or if the singer is singing about like like the it could be another know, language the devastation associated with like natural disasters right like, but then doesn't change there's another the angle music. to take with that and that's that everything involved with music is going to change or shape your experience with it from a more subjective mm -hmm. standpoint. Like yeah. when you're reading or listening to lyrics, maybe if you're like me, you're really shit at picking up on lyrics. So you have to read them. Yeah. It can't having this like a story or some kind of other bit of emotional resonance can make the music more impactful. Like I think yeah. a good example of that is like, if you think about the lyrics to Sonata Arctica's song, uh, White Pearl, Black Ocean, it's a fine song, but I think getting into the story of it makes like the crescendos that much more powerful. 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 <laughs> My opinion is that generally lyrics can only improve a song. In other words, if you know, there are bad lyrics or the lyrics aren't in another language or whatever. No, that doesn't really take away from the music. It's a nice bonus. Yeah. yeah. If there good. are exceptions, like if they're really hate filled lyrics and they're serious about that, like I think a Nazi song would make me feel uncomfortable. Or if yeah. they're trying to be obnoxious as hell. <laughs> yeah. And having but, lyrics themed a certain way can also be a draw for or a detriment to some people, kind of like you said, without yeah. making you uncomfortable. Absolutely. Like maybe maybe you're not into rap songs because they sing about you know getting money and fucking bitches or whatever. Like they're like I, I I know a lot of people who are not into <laughs> rap and hip hop because it, the lyrics are so mis misogynistic. Like they fucking just <laughs> see women as bitches and whatever. <laughs> maybe you're more into songs that are about slaying dragons. For the, yeah, maybe yeah. I'd rather maybe listen that's, to stuff maybe that's cool. dragons. I don't know. And it's it's cheesy and epic, and that's what people like. Maybe Gun to Soul John for Tolkien. Uh, who would do such a thing? <laughs> oh, no. Impossible. I have no idea. We're going to leave that for, for another moment. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I guess lyrics are, lyrics are a nice bonus, but they can also be a detriment if it's about really shitty things. I want to add on that since I'm not a native English speaker, yeah, uh, that uh, the thing that Zelda mentioned about not being able to pick up on the lyrics without reading is especially true for me, has been all my life. So I think that this is something very important. Um, you can have a song and you can, if it's a good song, if it's a great song and it's correctly, it's well performed and it achieves its objective, that means that I, without listening actively to the lyrics can understand what's the message behind the song like uh, Ed for example or, or, or for everyone who listens to ex-Japan we don't know Japanese for the most part and 
you can tell when a song is supposed to be saying something sad or saying something hopeful or saying something adventurous or saying something that is a bit bittersweet or whatever without actually going into the lyrics. And when... Generally. Yeah. yeah. And when you listen to a song and you get a certain message from it without knowing the lyrics, if you then go look the, for the lyrics and they actually match what you perceive, that makes it all the greater. But when they don't, that sucks. <laughs> It can be interesting, though, because you, know, you talk about X Japan, and they have the song Weekend, yeah. which, you know, if you listen to it as a native English speaker, it sounds weekend. like this kind of happy, weekend. exciting yeah. song <laughs> about weekends. You read the, you know, you go read a translation of the lyrics, and it's basically about a murder-suicide in rather graphic detail. Yeah. That's, and it's sort of I didn't know that. Oh, of, my God. I've been just listening to this Oh, yeah, it's you like, ruined it. <laughs> shimatsu means weekend, but it also means the end. It's like the end of their lives, I guess. Oh, yeah. shit. <laughs> what am I listening to? <laughs> See, this happens. And yeah. when you actually go look for the lyrics and they match, that makes usually can make the song greater. But without knowing the lyrics, really, you might still enjoy a great song without... A lot of the problem. Mm -hmm. And when you go in and it matches, and when you have a whole concept, like a whole theme along a full album, and all the lyrics actually follow, um, let's say, in for example, um, a story, and the music also is shaped in a certain way that makes you understand the bits of this story. Like we have a, a beginning and maybe a setup, uh, maybe a conflict and it ramps up, it gets faster and louder and maybe then it calms down a bit because something happened, it goes sad, then it goes hopeful, it goes happy again and then it ends. And then that's that to me would be a good concept album. And that the music follows a story that the lyrics might be telling as well but going both hand in hand and enhancing each other. Enhancing? I mean, I think it's more open than so that. So let's use um, an actual example. So um, it's like something that tells a story that has a buildup. Like, does Avantasia's Metal Opera Part 1 and 2 like convey any of its story with the music yeah i i with the music i gave a lot i looked a lot into uh their metal opera stuff like because I've, I've listened to them for years but never actually really read the story <laughs> yeah so this time in preparing for this episode i did listen through them read the lyrics didn't make a whole hell of a lot of sense uh yeah it's, you got to get through the toby lyrics yeah like oh, i don't know lyrics. how much of it is like artistic license and metaphor or how much of it is just like poor english <laughs> but like, you can get the gist of the story from the lyrics. It's like, okay, you got Toby plays this guy named Gabriel, who his sister is in prison for being a witch, and he gets help from a magical dude played by Michael Kiske, and they, like, escape from the church and go into, like, a magical world in his mind called Avantasia, and then there, there's there's something with a seal, and the Pope is trying to do something sketchy, yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't make a lot of sense, and there's some funny it's characters along the way. That, that's the gist of the story. Yeah, it's an interesting mix of history and fantasy. Mm -hmm. More leaning on fantasy than history, but you, know, you get the witch trials in there. And you also get a, a, a Monty Python witch. Yeah, I think it's an interesting idea for a story. I think Toby probably has a lot of lore involved in it. When I looked up like summaries online, yeah. I think the booklets or Toby's like interviews probably have a bit more involved stuff. Because there's a lot of details online that's like, I'm like, where are they getting these things? It's not lyrics at all. I, th <laughs> I think a lot of people's... I've, I've read several retellings of this story. I think it's just a lot of, like, you know, fans... Speculation. Fan fiction. Yeah, just speculating. Yeah, it's, it could be fan fiction based off what they think the lyrics is saying. Um, filling in the gaps. Yes, yeah. filling in the gaps. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, there's just something about Toby's lyrics that, I mean... I don't want to sound rude here, but it kind of sounds like he's on drugs when he's starting lyrics. <laughs> I think it's I read very that somewhere that I think he does that on purpose because he wants it to be to the listener's interpretation. He's not going to like feed you a story. Yeah, I mean, to his credit, it's kind of the same thing with uh, Ronnie James Dio. 
you get very fantastical lyrics, but also very open-ended lyrics. Yeah. Hmm. Right. So does uh does reading these narratives and does knowing the lyrics enhance your experience listening to these albums? In some ways, I thought the music like was fitting with the theme of like that song. Like there's one where he sees a vision of his friend being tortured in like a lake of fire. And it's like one of the more aggressive songs on um, Metal Opera Part 2. So I liked that. But in general, the the lyrics do a pretty horrible job of telling the story. Like a lot of big events are like told off screen. There's not a lot of like action happening in the actual lyrics. It's It's really hard to tell what's going on. They mostly just sing about like what they're thinking about or like a state of mind, so to speak. Like, did you know that Kai Hansen's character and Michael Kissy's characters die? And I don't think they even acknowledge it in the lyrics. Yeah, but according to the summaries I read that they die. I mean, they kind of, I think they're kind of mentioned at one point at the very end. Yeah. At the very I think end. at one point they say Vandroid died and like the whole plot gets kicked off by trying to like help Tobias's or Toby's sister. And yeah, it's and what happens. With they, that? they, they ignore it for a long time. <laughs> And then in the last song, it's like, oh, by the way, she was saved. And that's it. <laughs> oh, BT dubs. And, and it's like, oh, wait, there was like a big war and like a struggle over a seal in the tower. And none of that is acknowledged at the end. Okay. And so it, it doesn't wrap up anything in the plot. It's just like, oh, Toby and his sister have an uncertain future. Also, Michael Kiske's dead. And there you go. <laughs> yeah. So So I know I know, um, Metal Opera didn't have a lot of narration or any narration that I remember. It had a little. Uh, oh, yeah. It had the Monty Python, which... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It had the voice but, of the tower. Okay, there's certain albums that exist that have a lot of narration. <laughs> Do you think spoken word enhances these kind of, uh, I guess, narrative concept albums? It's not um, needed. I'd say it, I'd say it's how it It has depends. to be very well done, and it has to be yeah. well integrated yeah. with the musical aspect because if not you just have a person pausing your album to explain you what's going on and then resuming yeah like rhapsody that that ruins an album <laughs> it's distracting well, come on I'm you, sorry. Had, you had christopher lee <laughs> but christopher lee yeah, i christopher mean come lee. on i know but like i know he's very endearing and a lot of people are attached to him but i i feel like just spoken word in between the tracks is very yeah it just stops your musical experience yeah it shouldn't be I mean, I it's can. hard to do because you have to avoid yeah. this from happening. You can't have someone just pausing your album to explain what's going on. That's ruining your whole musical construct. You need to integrate it. If you need to have absolutely need a narrator, make sure to make it work with within your musical context. It should be another instrument. It's hard to do. And have a good performance. Get good voice actors or whatever. Yeah, and not only that, 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 that should be like the minimum thing to consider having <laughs> yeah. a good voice to have actor. Decent not, voice actors. Like, yeah. like, well, I'm gonna, and we're talking a lot about X Japan now, but <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to go back to it. It's not the same, but you have uh, the song Say Anything by X Japan that mm -hmm. at the end has a spoken word or its final chorus that is repeating and repeating, which is uh, Yoshiki reading a letter and and that that works great in the context of that song. Yeah. And it's really touching and it gives you it has all this emotional um weight to it. You you can make this work. It's hard when you're trying just to make it in this like if you really want to use spoken word to convey information for the story you're trying to tell, first consider do I really need to do that? Or should I recheck the rest of my lyrics? Or if it really does serve a good purpose overall for the narrative, can I make it actually work with the music that I'm making? I remember you singing uh, Say Anything for a Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that sounds so nice. <laughs> that song is nice. It was a nice. It's a lovely performance. It was a nice. <laughs> Nice is not the right word to describe no, that. No, but, but we just appreciate you singing. That song is like very, I think it's very sad and touching. It is. To me. Yeah. Yeah. So I think. Um, Rather than narration, a technique that I like very much is something that Avantasia does a lot of is using different singers for different characters, which I think does help tell the story and also just gives you some variety. Unless yeah. you have different singers. So That's I really like that they do that. The approach of 
musical feel. But that it does money. make it that more does. difficult. But that's why you and have touring also a pain in the ass. That's why you play the main character yourself so that it's easier to get access to the person who does the most singing. <laughs> Oh, and then you can just like hire whoever's local. Basically, the opposite of very on. Yeah. <laughs> How do you guys feel about? Um, so this is basically what Avantasia does, where they sort of tell like a fantasy story because you know dark or power metal has tons and tons of fantasy stuff. Where instead of writing a book, they made a power metal album. Mm-hmm. You know, Avantasia does it. Rhapsody is the probably the number one example. We see other bands like Ancient Bards in Fairyland or Twilight Forest or Glory Hammer. The list goes on and on. They sort oh, of, so fantastical. They tell their fantasy stories through power metal. They tell their fantasy stories, but they just tend to not be very good stories. They're usually very generic. Yes, without... very, very, very generic. They involve uh, kings and lands and mountains. I think the best example, like, we were talking about Dragonland a lot earlier. Under the Grey Banner is a fantastic album. In the lyrics, it's <laughs> the most generic fantasy thing ever. You've got a hero, <laughs> you've got an, an evil king. The hero goes and he teams up with the elves and the dwarves They have a battle. And You've got that's a it. horse. Too. Oh, oh, yeah, they have a horse, and it, <laughs> it's black. It's a, it's a black mare. It's a mare. It's a good song. <laughs> Is that female <laughs> horse? It's a mare. That's female, right? I would advise. I don't know anything to, uh... about horses. Sorry, horse-loving listeners. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I, I I would advise bands to adapt other stories. Is a lot of bands have done a very good job of doing that, and. It's just a struggle to think of a band that has really nailed writing their own story and presenting that in an album. In like a fantasy thing. Especially fantasy. That's why we have Nightfall and Middle Earth. Yeah, but that's not original material. Yeah. That's why you said that's adapting. Right. That's yeah. Oh, yeah, adapting. For sure. Mm-hmm. But we'll get some more yes. of Nightfall and Middle Earth next time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're, we're going to see them. Or will we? Teasers. <laughs> not foreshadowing at all. Anyway, so those are like a good, a lot of good examples of fantasy based uh, power metal albums. But there are also um, concept albums that are less fantasy based. Very um, tragic, some, some of yeah, them. Yeah, very tragic. Um, <laughs> so a good example of this would be Sabotage Streets, a rock opera. It says rock opera in the title. Yeah, so you know <laughs> so it's a rock opera. We know it's a concept but really, album. I think it's more of a musical than an opera. Well, the, the term rock opera is used when you're just doing a musical that has guitars and drums. That It's not really an opera, yeah, I mean, but it's used like that. Well, I think this brings up a good discussion point, which is the difference between musicals and operas. With the musical, it's really all about the story. I mean, mm-hmm. this thing is kind of that you get actors who can sing and in opera it's really all about the music and you get singers who can yeah. act mm, that's a good point mm-hmm. i never really thought about mm-hmm. it that way and with soft house streets i mean this seems to be more about the story than it is about yeah. the music it's, you think I so? pretty much of a story though well yeah it's, i mean it's not a plot so <laughs> but the music is the music's really dictated by the yeah. story or the plot whatever that exists yeah. And that has some pitfalls, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, so the concept of streets is based off of uh, something that Paul O'Neill wrote, which was supposed to be a Broadway play. And it's basically about this um, former rock star, DT Jesus, who, like, he's all washed kinda up, fucked up, and became like a drug dealer and like just like a street homeless dude he's on the streets he used, hence the name yeah he's on the streets and he used to be famous and yeah and and it has way too many ballads it does yeah, have the, way too the many entire ballads. album is a lot of it's a lot of like emotional power ballads which i love because i fucking love power ballads don't we all <laughs> but there needs to be a limit i mean sabotage puts out great power ballads but yeah it, it's too much it's the same problem that uh Dream Theater had on their last album, The Astonishing. Right. Uh, the lyrics. I'm not even oh. going to compare Sabotage to that piece of garbage. <laughs> <God>. <laughs> I don't know. I I think it's pretty ghost. Good I album. don't think so. Well, you know, I hear like I hear a lot of people love Streets, but I also hear a lot of like Sabotage fans say this is one of this is where they've all gone downhill. Well, a lot of the songs <laughs> on Streets were you know ballads. The lyrics, like we said, were mostly. Talking about like drug addiction or yeah. like struggles with uh, like questioning God or something like that, mm-hmm. which I felt like it got kind of repetitive hearing about how shit his life was over mm-hmm. and over again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah with yeah, a, it with really an over dramatic ballad. 
And it ends with Believe, which is like a really, really beautiful ballad. It was, yeah, like, the ballads are all good ballads. Mm -hmm. It's just not my it's, taste. There's too yeah. many of yeah. them. I think it's too long. And they're all the same kind I of ballad. I think they made it like four songs too long. It yeah. is a long album. The, there's think... a lot of repeating. Both yeah, in the way they, yeah, it, both in the way of the lyrics are structured, because sometimes they they touch on they touch on stuff for too long. It's not needed. We understood it. Like I, it's like I get yeah. it. He's drug addicted, and, and also the he's songs sad. He's on the street. There are too many songs, and it, it it starts to drag at some point. Do you think that this album, like, if it wasn't a concept album, it would be a weak album? Yes. Yes, and this brings a point when when you're doing concept album and especially a rock opera, the story becomes part of the music. Yes. And I think in this case, the music clearly, if, if you omit all the lyrics, if you don't read them, the way the songs are, are structured and how they play into each other, at least up until the last four songs, there's a lot of songs here, um, you can really tell that they are trying to tell a story that has its ups and downs. It starts with just, well, with the general intro. This is one album that has spoken word done right mm -hmm. in the context of the, of its music. I think the spoken word on this album was actually really well done. Yeah, it wasn't distracting. It was great. It works mm -hmm. perfectly. And it sets you up for these first songs that are really high up, like, yeah, everything is going all right. And then it starts going down. And it goes into some darker territory. Then it starts to slow down. It gets sad. It tries to pick up and then goes sad again. No, you just hear like the desperation of our main character. It tries to get happy again, like four songs in. And then the next like 10 songs are all sad. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, you think yeah. it's like, it, it, it's kind of like the ups and downs of like a terrible yeah. drug addiction or something, yeah. which I think it conveys. I think the most, well. the most interesting song in the album is Agony and Ecstasy. It's like a more aggressive song, and, it, and it's an said from the perspective of like his drug addiction, where it's like taunting him. Yeah, I, I really liked that one. Mm -hmm. I think the lesson here is that when you're don't do drugs, planning kids. out your concept album, <laughs> well that too, but when you're you know writing your story or thinking of your concept, and you're planning out how you're going to adapt that into music. You no, know, you have to factor in how it's going to sound to the audience. You no. Know, you can have a sad album, but you need variance within yeah. that. You need to present it in a way that you know it's just not going to be power ballad after power ballad. You can't just be a donor constantly. <laughs> yeah, I guess if it, this if this album didn't have the narrative of DT Jesus, it would just be like, all right, another ballad. Okay, another ballad. So I okay. would say an album that did sort of like the sad story concept much better. Will be Queen's Reich's Operation Mind Crime. Yes, I, I gave this album like its first proper listen the other day, and I was very impressed. You know, some very lovely riffs, pretty cool story, interestingly told. I mean, it addresses a lot of the same core ideas as Streets. Yeah, it's like yeah, a, to, a drug to addicted guy. Say, yeah, to, yeah. To sum up the yeah. story, it's it's there's just a a yeah a drug addicted guy who's like man, he's being brainwashed. <laughs> Yeah. He's being turned into an he's like a political radical revolutionary dude mm -hmm. and he gets brainwashed by Dr. X to kill people and he like feels really powerful but then uh he and this like former prostitute nun want to get out but they can't and people die and it's sad. And then he goes into a mental institution and he's haunted by his, the nightmares of what he's done. It's happy. <laughs> so you have this you have this dystopian sci-fi take on things. And it really allows for more of the variants that, you know, has referring to more before. And it has its nice ballads, too. But it has but it just... has a better pacing, you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Pacing's utterly key for albums. Especially for, for, like, narrative albums that are meant to be listened from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, I, I was really into this one, like, the different, I guess, twists and turns that the music and the story would take. With its sort of, uh, forgive the joke, but uh, climaxing with the Sweet Sister Mary song. Ha ha ha. Ha 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 ha. Hilarious. I think the, the end was maybe a little too drawn out with like, oh no, she's dead and I'm sad. But, oh well. Maybe you just gotta let people be sad, okay? I guess they gotta be sad. 
It was it was still good yeah, songs for like four songs. When I compare Streets and Operation Mindcrime, I don't think I would go back to Streets, but I def I, as soon as I finished, I wanted to go back to Operation Mindcrime just because the songs were just that good. But maybe some some days you're just in a mood for like six ballads. Okay, maybe you are. You know what? I think I know Larry was really into Streets. He wasn't here to talk about it, so we'll give him his representation. Yeah, no, he he loves Streets, and I actually I I fucking love Streets too. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can say it, it, it was good. It, it was really good. Uh, I I really liked listening to it, uh, and I think I want to say this. I wanted to say this, and I wanted to show it in at some point. But uh, Streets, it's really really inspired by the Who, and probably their concept, one of their concept albums, which is Tommy. Oh, and yeah, so, I, re I read the synopsis for that. It was pretty creepy. So if anyone liked Streets and didn't know, go and listen to The Who because you love it. <laughs> and if you listen to Tommy, which is The Who's concept album, which is rock, old rock, um, it it's constructed in very much the same way. The, the songs, besides having this full landscape of the whole album and how the songs are going up or down and carrying you to these different emotional places inside the songs uh you have certain musical motifs that are repeated at certain points like when you know that when the character is going through some moment of redemption or something you have a specific chord progression and where some character is going through a very sad time, they might hit some specific chord progression or melody. And this happens in streets as well. Yeah, I like that in a, in concept albums, you have, you know, like recurring recurring phrases of music. Like mo um, like motifs and themes, yeah. In well done concept yeah. albums. It's kind of like in a motifs. TV show or a movie when like a certain character has like their theme that might be played in certain different yeah. ways. No, this goes all the way back to opera. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it does. And maybe it's not required that actually each character has a, a specific uh, phrase or theme, or it's not really necessary to just shove in this same melody in every song. But some general callbacks, like in the streets and the who, you have certain moments in the songs when the lyrics go to a place that is hopeful and they always do uh, do it sonically in the same way they just go up um you have big symbols splashing everywhere and the melody of the lead vocals uh goes higher in a way that is reminiscent from the other tracks where that happened as well and that helps you keep it together and perceive everything as one long piece of work i think believe on streets kind of did something like that the last song hmm. mm -hmm. and that's to me to me that's important also in in concept albums like you need to have besides having your well-written story and well conveyed the best way to convey it is to make sure that every song is actually musically related to the others in some way ideally i well yeah we have bad albums and everything but i think you should if you're listening and you're planning on doing a concept album <laughs> look into this please <laughs> need to tie it in together not yeah. just lyrically but musically and according to the wikipedia definition you know, even if it's just musical concepts that are related that can still count as a concept album yeah so yes. the albums that we've discussed so far uh the metal opera streets and operation mind crime sort of have a story or a narrative going with those albums <laughs> So next, I want to talk about um, the albums that some people may or may not consider concept albums, but basically um, an album with like a theme. So some of examples, mm -hmm. an example of this could be uh, Sabaton's Carolus Rex. Yeah, I mean, Sab Sabaton in general, you could say are all concept albums because they have like yeah. the themes of yeah. war. Most of them are. concept discography. I mean, most of them tying to a specific aspect like us two were heroes in the last stands which you know they're fairly vague but those are yeah, some concepts yeah but all the heroes in all the like stories are encapsulated within one song yeah so it's arguably not a very well done concept album <laughs> no. is that a concept album even it's or is it just, is yeah, it just I, like, i'd say so i mean a collection of if, songs if you go into the idea that everything's tied into this one i one theme 
you know, it's a vague yeah. theme, but it's still I, there. I would say personally that as choosing a theme and without any other connection that makes you say, I'm going to enjoy this better if I listen to the full album instead of just listening to a couple of songs, all the songs in any order, then that's not enough to call it the concept album. And going back to... Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Yeah. And this is the argument where my opinion on that is that that's the difference between a bad and a good concept album. <laughs> and I think I think I'm with Darko here. That's the difference between not a concept album and a concept album. You also run the risk of being too repetitive <laughs> if you're just doing like yeah. one concept. And that's what I wanted to address here because I mentioned just before that you should have your songs tie musically between each other using similar motifs and melodies or whatever. And I listened to Carlos Rex for the first time like two weeks ago. I have only listened before to the two most pop, two three most popular Sabaton songs, which are I guess Forty to One, Primo Victoria, Army Ratios, and um, Ghost Primo Division. Victoria. Ghost Division. <laughs> so I listened to Carlos that Rex, is- and it's <laughs> you don't have to use the same melodies over and over. <laughs> it's too much. It's the same song over and over again. It's what they're known for. It's like and we get it. That doesn't You're make a concept about... album. Carol Sorex is actually one of the uh, better albums You're talking for about that. like his uh, Swedish history and King history, Charles. Rise and, and fall of the yeah. Swedish yeah. It covers yeah. like a hundred years of history though. It's not just one yeah. guy. Well, kind of. It basically covers the rise of the Swedish Empire through uh, Gustav Adolphus and the... 30 Years War. Yeah. That takes up like half the album. And then it's it jumps like seven, towards like Charles the 11th and 12th. Yeah, 70 years Charles or so. Charles himself. And then getting defeated at Poltova and kind of like the downfall of Sweden. Yeah. But hey, you know, I learned that from <laughs> listening to the album, reading the lyrics. So hey. it worked. Listening to the album and reading you the lyrics the inspired you to Wikipedia the rest of the history. Well, well interesting <laughs> thing about uh, Sabaton that they, I think they just recently did this. On their website, they have all the lyrics, and on each song, they'll have like additional historical details. So that's neat. That's cool. That's nice. So that, it's yeah, like that, they actually cool. want you to like, you know, think about this. Yeah. You know, I think it's nice because if they didn't write these songs, then like nobody would give a shit about Swedish history. But yeah, I guess well, some, some people, people do. Would. <laughs> I, I cared about this stuff before. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're the <laughs> history like guy. History. There was but some. Like, uh, yeah. You think history is interesting? You know. You know, Sabaton, sometimes they can get a bit too repetitive with how they talk about history. It's like, oh, there was a battle and it took place on this year and people died. Yeah, they're and not this is the army history. ratio yeah. within that battle. But they're <laughs> in Carolus Rex, I noticed they even had, they had some some nice details in there. It's one of their better albums like for the, that. Like the Carolans would be like, oh, you know, look for the whites in their eyes before opening fire. Or like Lion from the North, they tied into like, they tried to use like a propaganda prophecy of like they're saving the Catholics yeah. from the church or whatever. I mean, you can kind of pick up that the Thirty Years' War wasn't such a great time. It's a thirty-year war, no. <laughs> <laughs> but it was especially brutal. Right. Yeah, it, you actually like uh, the song was called "Lifetime of War," right? Mm-hmm. It was actually you, you can actually like hear uh, our singer Joachim Broden. I'm sorry, I'm bad at pronouncing things. Like being expressive instead of just like. His, now there's an interesting self. thing about that song because there are actually two versions of this album there's the oh, yeah. english version and there's the swedish mm-hmm. version sure. yeah. and if you go to google translate or whatever most of the songs are pretty much the same but that song it's just completely different and in, yeah in the english version it's a very broad very general depiction of 30 years war and you know it's horrors and yeah you know, everything about it with the Swedish version, it's a very personal take about, you know, this guy going off to war and leaving his family and all that stuff. That's quite a and, striking difference. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. Huh? And honestly, if they, I, honestly, it might just be that, you know, it's a language unfamiliar to me, but I think he sounds a bit more emotional in the uh, Swedish version. I think bands usually, when they are speaking their, like, native languages, their songs are a bit more interesting. Like, I've listened to a lot of Equilibrium. And they've been doing more and more songs in English recently. And it feels like they just don't have the same impact that the ones in German do, even though they're growling with the lyrics. Or when we saw, no, we saw, we saw tour or tier or whatever. And when they <laughs> do songs in, is it Faroese? Is that the language? I'm not. Yeah. Like, it just sounds so much cooler. 
I feel like they they get more well, into I mean, it than when it's in English. I think part of it is that they're more comfortable in their native language. Yeah. There is uh, one important thing is that the singer must know what he's saying, like and, and be able to relate to it to actually give a good performance. Where be able to emphasize convey. things properly. Yeah, because you can say the words, but that doesn't mean you are really giving the message across to the audience. Yeah, that's a really good point. You have to be able to connect with the lyrics that you yeah. are singing. It's more about the emotional yeah. voice than it's lyrics. Exactly. Yeah. And sometimes not having the lyrics or having lyrics that are in your native language, you may be, it's like you know the words, but you might not really know what you're saying. And that happens too. And a lot also, of like, you, you wrote the lyrics. Like, th these people are writing the lyrics. There's no, like, secret Swedish pop singer, like, um, like no, not, not pop singer, like, pop music writer. Manager. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. From, like, some... It's usually from Sweden. Like, yeah, it's I, from Sweden. I, I remember reading this somewhere. Yeah, yeah. all the pop songs in the American top 40s are written by, like, some person in Sweden. Less Sweden. Like, they're writing... People in, in these bands are writing their own lyrics, you know? So... If they're writing in a language they're more comfortable being expressive in, then you'll be able to hear that in their performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, in another thematic album that I thought was interesting is by Angra, um, Aurora Consurians. So usually Angra is well known for um, Rebirth and Temple of Shadows and even Angels Cry. But this, is this great album, album too. seems to be, yeah, this album seems to be sort of overlooked in her discography and um, I am not sure if it's actually a concept album because like there's not really a narrative, but each of the tracks. Look, look, concept albums don't need a narrative. Whatever. That's what a rock opera is for. Each of the tracks in this album is a mental illness. That's a concept. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it counts. Uh, well, it no, counts. I'm, I, 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 this is what what I what I tried to mention before that for agree with me. You can say, hey, okay, we're going to do this album and we're going to put a limita limitation on ourselves. We're going to write about this thing only. And that's cool. But do I gain anything from listening to the whole album in order instead of just the different songs at different times? Yeah, these songs could all stand alone by themselves. There's not really like a need but to listen to them But that doesn't have to do if it's a concept album or not. Like all good albums, regardless of if they're concept albums or not would benefit from having good pacing and you know, having the full album experience. Yeah, yeah, no, I that's, guess in theory, that's where I draw the theory, line. Yeah. Because that, that's, this is why I don't listen to albums generally. Because most albums in most genres of music are just collections of songs. But they shouldn't be. But no, that's, that's the difference. That's what I call concept albums. The ones that actually are conceptualize us but, that, a f but that's not what a full thing instead of just doing a collection of songs which is the norm but the norm is just releasing a no. collection of songs a concept album has a concept it doesn't have to do with good songwriting or good album writing no that's that's well i i'm saying the same thing as you <laughs> i'm using the, the same to justify my stance you can Compose. You can take a, f a couple of good songs. I did all these great songs, and I'm going to present them in this way, which is an album which has been the standard for like 50, 60, 70 now years of music industry. And then you have the difference, which is to say, I'm going to actually make one piece of work, which is this whole thing that might be divided, like a book divided into chapters instead of just a collection of short novels, of short stories. Yeah, th there's. I think there's a difference between, like what Darko said, collection of short stories versus chapters in a unifying book. And you can have a non-concept album that has really good flow. Yeah, have, like, pacing and variety are important things to have in your artistic work. Yeah, no. yeah I mean, that... To me, that just seems like what an album should do. While Angra is in my mind, Re Rebirth, Rebirth is a really good album with excellent flow that and then doesn't have a unifying concept. No, we were debating this earlier, but then there's Heroes in the Last Stand, which are just a collection of singles, basically, but oh. they have a unifying concept. I, it's, I, I don't know. I would say it's more of a theme album. It's Just the yeah. fact that they are but, tied. I mean, consider this. You could have a collection of songs... All about last stands, or you could have 
an album in there. Yeah. <laughs> so original. <laughs> or you could have an album where you have like Lust and Song. Then you have a song about you know, space. You have a song about um, the Dutch mercantilist system. You could have a song about you know, how you're feeling today. You know, do you see the difference yeah, there? Yeah, but I go, I go back to saying that to say that something is a concept album to me means that I get the full package, the actual full thing that the writer intended and that I can gain something extra for listening to the album as one long piece of work than just the songs by themselves. Because I can make... I can make an album that has 10 songs and they all talk about um, different invasions in different moments in time and don't really care about, hey, so what does this do? Like if you put those 10 songs on shuffle, it yeah. wouldn't change the listener's that, experience. Like, that's is, it. It an, is it an exploration of a, of a concept or just a bunch of examples of a concept? I'm not sure if there's a dis, if there I think it distinction or a difference, perhaps. <laughs> I think it yeah, I think you guys are both overall. hitting important the two like halves yeah. of yeah. concept album. I, mean, I think the point here is that we're not going to agree on Remember this. Remember it's the big. start of this conversation yeah. where I said yeah. varies among critics with no discernible consensus. There we go. That's what we have here. reached that point. We are critics. Wikipedia and was we right not, again. And we have not reached any consensus. So everyone <laughs> tell us what you think. What's your take on this? Yes, matter? please get involved. Write comments. Message us. Tell us how yeah. wrong we are. Like, comment, subscribe. Too. <laughs> and I'll just remind you that our Facebook, uh, is it called username? Is Powerful Podcast. And that is also our username on Instagram. So message us there and let us know what do you think counts as a concept album? Um, and I know uh, people are going to say, but you didn't mention Arion or or Seventh Wonder, or Virgin Steel's Marriage of Heaven and Hell, Parts 1 and 2, and Invictus. That's very specific. We know. Or Glory Hammer. We know. Oh, I, Glory no, Hammer. I mentioned Glory Hammer earlier. It's fine. <laughs> Whatever. Oh, got it covered. I don't care about Glory Hammer, and y'all know that. Um, yeah, so w there's no way we can talk about this, like every single concept album there are that too many. exists. There every are too has many. One. Um, so... Uh, if you think we miss one of your like favorite ones, uh, let us know. Maybe one of us hasn't heard it, and we'll give it a listen. I'm curious. Do you guys w would you consider something like Beast and Black's Berserker to be a concept album, having most songs based off of Berserk? Oh, I don't know. It's uh, a theme uh, album maybe? to me, but I don't. I don't think really. See... Yeah, it's like it's it. it ha I haven't looked closer into it. Has it has like no. Ed's side of like oh it uh, is like a concept based off of th a thing because it's you know it's Berserk. But from Darko's side, like you don't get anything out of the album by listening to it as a whole. It's yeah, just I, yeah. I listen to it as a whole. I listen to it as a whole. And... Stop before we go no, back. No, no, no. Yeah. I opened, well, I opened up Ed a can of worms. Say, I'm sorry. This, this is it, as Ed, as Ed would say. This is a mediocre concept album, and as Darko would yeah. say, this is not a concept album. We got to cover. So, so we've listen got, to the good got, ones we've... that we can agree on. <laughs> we we we've got our like own little personal definitions and again music music is subjective like everyone experiences exactly. in different ways and like lyrics matter to some people more than others and like lyrics can be like a really powerful way like music is the way that you know people express themselves and like start revolutions you know <laughs> so you know in a way that in a way in that way like lyrics are really important Or they're not, All because right. <laughs> some people don't care and they just listen to the music. And that's fine, too, because music... Or maybe they're sometimes supportive. Music, I think, more than like almost any other art form, is just about how you feel about it in the moment. And like the emotions that it's causing mm -hmm. you to feel. It's yep. like, oh, this sounds pleasurable to me. I agree. It's not like a movie where it's like, this has inconsistencies in the plot. Or a, a, a television <laughs> show where, oh, no, this was a filler episode, there's no character development. Or it's like, but there are filler songs in an album. There could be, but I'll make the point that I don't give a fuck. Can I say fuck? You yes, can, you I can. Have we said fuck so many yeah. times. I think we can. I I do not. <laughs> I I don't care like what kind of music you like. Like I don't like Sabaton. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. Um, I think we've made that clear at this point. Like 
when when you listen to music just like think about what you really like and like what connects with you like it doesn't really matter what anyone else tells you and like we can make suggestions on like what you may like if you like a certain band like for fans of sabotage listen to this trans um, orchestra but at the end of the day like that's your own decision to make and um I will shit on Glory Hammer all day, but if you <laughs> like Glory Hammer, I'm not gonna take that away from you. I'd you, say you okay. do you. <laughs> we won't hate enjoy you. What we, you. Enjoy what you enjoy. We still love you. Enjoy what you enjoy. Yeah. And... Don't let mean old four gates take what you enjoy away from you. Yeah, and also subscribe to our podcast <laughs> 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 on right iTunes, that. Stitcher, and Google Play, so you don't miss any episodes of us ranting angrily at um, things that don't really matter, but they do to us because we all like music, right? right. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let's wrap this up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for listening. Goodbye. And. Find us on our social media, Powerful Podcast, and we will catch you next time. Stay powerful. Don't forget to listen to every episode one after the other because it's a big concept season. (laughs) (laughs) Holy shit. Fucking God. (laughs) That was amazing. Oh, my God.